Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Developing the Leader Within podcast. Today, I have a special guest. And you know, uh, last week, we had unveiled my five-week podcast plan to not only introduce you to heavy-hitting leaders in the military that are now doing their own thing, but also the men that comprise my advisory council, those guys that I surround myself with. And today we have Boris Bolanos. He is a retired command sergeant major in the army. Uh, his last position was with the Center for the Army Profession and Ethic uh, out of West Point. And I am so happy to have you with me today. Uh, we go back ways, <laughs> a long ways. Uh, yes. But uh, Boris, thank you for being with us on the show today. Thank you so much, um, Enrique. I am humble and I am honored uh, to be your uh, your guest speaker today. Um, this is a this is a long time coming event that we have been talking about since since I remember October of last year was when we first even even my, maybe a little bit earlier when we did started discussing your vision for uh, Triad Leadership Solutions, and I think that's. Uh, you know, it's a dream come true because that's where your passion is. That's where your heart is. And I, I believe that everything that we do in life, uh, when we put our heart and our passion, uh, you know, as our, you know, first foot forward, uh, things uh, make a difference. And I think, uh, you know, we're up for something uh, great. Uh, you know, I read a book a long time ago called uh, Good to Great. I don't know if you've, you've seen it out there. That, and that red just, cover, that red cover. <laughs> red cover, red cover and white letters. And, uh, you know, and, and I have a copy uh, autographed by the author because he was one of our guest speakers one year, one of our senior leader conferences in the army. But, you know, it, it talks about, uh, you know, how you move from being a, a, a good, you know, call it good organization to a great organization. And what is what is the difference between the two? You know, uh, you know, you you hear the, uh, the you know the axiom. You know, it's good enough, good enough, good enough. Okay, right. it's good good enough. Well, no, it is not enough because we live in a very uh, competitive environment, market, and and everybody's trying to, you know, uh, gain predominance in, in in whatever area of the market they're in. And I think uh, goods will be lagging behind and great and those who uh, you know strive to excellence will definitely dominate uh, future markets because you know that's in the heart and in the mind of people and that translates into action yeah i totally agree and uh, today's topic is one of those things that are going to drive some people to action when we're talking about leadership and ethics uh, I know that we've talked at length about ethical behavior and things in the military leadership and all those things. But we, before we get into all the good things you're going to share with us, uh, <laughs> give us a little bit about your background, what you're doing, uh, and you know your your military and and now. Absolutely. Well, I uh, <clears throat> I joined the army in uh, in March of, two, of 1989, and when I joined the army. I joined the army because I sense a calling um, into service. Um, my, my, you know, and I want to be very open. Uh, God called me into service into the United States Army Chaplain Corps, um, and and I follow that 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 prompting to uh, you know put on the uniform and and serve my country, as we call it, you know, in the United States Army Chaplain Corps for for God and country. Um, and I started, you know, as a, as, a, as a low PFC, private first class in the army, um, you know, went through a lot of problems. So I was uh, in basic combat training. I, I, I didn't know that I was gonna get out of basic combat training uh, back in March of 1989, because I suffered uh, two severe stress fractures as I was going through week two of, uh, you know, we call it BCT as an acronym. And that, um, you know, uh, I overcame that. Um, you know, you know, by 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 using and using and believing that that calling was going to materialize. That calling was was something greater than I didn't understand at that time. But you know, uh, God was taking me through a, a, a purifying 
process. And, and you know, he was, he was testing my faith. He was testing my, my resolve, my grit, you know, as, as an early uh, soldier in the army. And, um, you know, I got out of basic combat training, as I, as I say it, you know, wide open uh, by the grace of God. You know, I graduated. Uh, and then I moved on to uh, advanced individual training. And, and, you know, to my surprise, I graduated advanced individual training. Back then, the school was at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, that's where the, uh, the chaplain school, the United States Army Chaplain School was located. Uh, I graduated with honors. I was the distinguished honor graduate of my advanced individual training class. Unbelievable. After struggling for, for 10 weeks, a basic comeback training, trying to make it through the initial phase of uh, soldiering, you know, to moving on to my specialization area and graduating with, with honors, it, it was, I don't know, it was a miracle. And I, I look at, you know, I look at my, my, my trajectory in the army and I said, that is my testimony, that is my story. And that's why I need to tell it to people. Because, uh, you know, uh, I remember my recruiter telling me uh, when, I, when I enlisted, uh, when I went to the recruiting station in uh, Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, he said, he sat me down in his office and he was a station commander. And he said, you know, Boris, I'm gonna tell you the truth and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, but it is what it is. First, you're gonna eat the bone. And then later, you're gonna eat the meat. And I looked at him like, I wanna eat a bone? What do you mean by that? Um, what he meant by that was that, you know, uh, I was gonna see, I was gonna reap the benefits of, of, of being a soldier and then later on being a leader, but it was gonna be a process that at the beginning was gonna be very dry, very rough. It was gonna be, um, you know, almost like, an, you know, climbing an unsurmountable mountain. Uh, but at the end, you know, I, I understood that. And, you know, you, you won't believe this, but about seven, eight years down the road, I, I got to be stationed at the same place that my recruiter was stationed at. And that, that was, uh, I told him that story, like, you know, do, do you remember telling me that I was gonna eat a bone and then I wanna eat the meat and all? I said, I used to tell that to every recruit. I said, well, guess what? You know, it, 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 it became a reality in my life. So I, I appreciate you telling me that because I use those nuggets to tell people about leadership. Okay, leaders, leaders are not born, leaders are made. Because we're gonna we're gonna jump into this this area of leadership in a little bit, um, but you know back to my trajectory in the army, um, you know that was my beginning, and then I started you know going to my first duty station, um, you know Fort Carson, Colorado, with an armor battalion, uh, heavy mechanized infantry. You know that was a phenomenal assignment for me. It was tough, but you know it 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 it, it built a fabric within me of you know, one of the questions that you, that you formulated here about, you know, uh, what does ethics mean to you and how did that guide your career? It was at that first assignment, uh, you know, there were two leaders that really influenced me in a powerful way. The first one was Chaplain John Peters. That, that man, I'm telling you, he touched my life like nobody else has done in the past in my career. And the second one was Staff Sergeant and Uncommissioned Officer by the name of Daryl Heisey. You know, he taught me most of everything that I know today about leadership. He lived it, he, he exemplified it, and he modeled it. And, and, and that became my, my model but for leadership, uh, literally speaking, because he showed me, you know, everything that is, um, that is, you know, concentrated in that word leadership. You know, what, what a leader must be, what a leader must know, what a leader must, must be, uh, no, do, you know, be, no one do. And also, you know, he, he also coached me, he taught me, he trained me, he mentored me. And up to this day, let me tell you, we're still in touch. Um, so that, you know, that, that was the beginning. And obviously, you know, the army, you, 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 you move down you know, or, or up the pyramid, uh, you know, throughout your career and that, you know, 30 years of service, you know, it's hard to kind of um, compact that in, in, in this podcast, but, you know, um, I serve in every leadership position that there is in the United States Army from squad leader to platoon sergeant, um, 
you know, all the way to being a command sergeant major in the army. But that took me to places and, and situations, leadership situations that, you know, kind of shape who we are today. And those experiences um, really is what we, what we treasure as we talk about leadership issues and leadership strategies. And we're trying to help organizations now to, to succeed by applying these this basic principles of leadership. You know, I read a book recently, it's called The EQ Leader. And in that book, you know, as I'm reading the introduction and the first couple of chapters, it talks about leadership being, being viewed from three different perspectives. So the first perspective that the author talks about is the perspective of, um, you know, the, the researchers, those who research and study leadership and they gather their experiences from, from, you know, from the research groups, from the big data, the, 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 the analysis that is done at different universities and whatnot, corporations. You know, the second group is the one that gathers, you know, the, the one that uh, talks about leadership from a theoretical and academic perspective. You know, they might not necessarily been ser have served as a leader, but, you know, they talk about leadership from a book perspective. And the third group is the one that you and I fit in with, within. It's, it's the ones that are, have boots on the ground. We have, we have lived and we have breathed, uh, you know, what leadership is all about because we have, we have had firsthand experience, firsthand experience leading soldiers, leading sailors, leading men and women in combat, in, in tough situations where, you know, leadership is, uh, is tested. And that's the thing, leadership has to be tested. Um, so, you know, uh, going towards the end of my career, I think uh, it's important to highlight a couple of things. One is I, I have served at every single theater of operations that exists in the Army, the Pacific. I served in Korea as a Sergeant Major for the Religious Support Office there in Jiangsan uh, back in 2004, 2006. I served in the Pacific, in, in Hawaii, in the United States Army Pacific, which is Army Service Component Command to PACOM, Pacific Command. I served in Europe as the United States Army Europe uh, Senior Relief Affairs uh, Sergeant Major, advising uh, you know, the, the senior chaplain there in theater and the commander, the three-star general and the Sergeant Major on all matters related to morals and ethics and things that affect uh, the force in those respects. And also, uh, my, my penultimate assignment before I retired was as a command sergeant major of the United States Army Chaplain Center and School, uh, you know, which, which uh, you know, brought me to uh, this, this, this juncture in my career where I could actually change, affect change at the institutional level, at the level of training and education. Because as you know, the Army and probably the Navy and Marine Corps, the Air Force, uh, we have uh, domains of, of, of different things. And the Army has, you know, three domains basically in which we operate, training, education, and experience. And you, you at one point in your career, you're in one of those three domains. You're either uh, improving yourself, bettering yourself, you're educating yourself academically. As you know, for instance, when I went to, to the United States Army, Army Academy for nine months, you know, nine months in a school learning about how to be a strategic leader. I mean, that is, that is an investment that the government makes in every senior leader in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps. We have uh, Navy uh, senior petty officers there uh, and, 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 and ones that want to be master chiefs as well. We have people from the Air Force. Uh, and then, you know, post this Army Youth Academy, uh, that investment, then you go to, you know, when you become a sergeant, command sergeant, major, you go to pre-command courses you know, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, you know, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So uh, the investment in, in leadership training and education that, that the United States military makes in developing leaders of character, it, it's absolutely impressive. Um, I think if I were to put a, a dollar figure on, on how much the, you know, the US government invested in, in training you and I, for instance, myself, you know, as, as you know, in a, in, a, in a career of 30 years, I will put a figure around maybe, uh, you know, half a million dollars. It's really impressive. There's a lot of money invested. But why do they do that, Enrique? They do that because it is a requirement. It's part of the, 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 the Army leader's requirement. Uh, you know, you cannot lead unless you are qualified to lead. You cannot get a promotion 
unless you have met the prerequisites, the educational, the training prerequisites, and the experience prerequisites to lead forces, to lead, to lead, you know, uh, an organization. Because you know, there's too much at stake. And 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 we and, and one of the things that the the army does in particular, we protect that investment because all that translates into performance and ethical performance. Make sure that that what we do is 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 ethically sound and it conforms to the expectations of the American people. That is our audience. That is our client. We serve the American people. So it's really important that we keep that in mind. And my last assignment at West Point was kind of the pinnacle because I was selected for that job. And, um, you know, it, it was a very, uh, uh, very scrutinizing process. Uh, so I, I serve as a senior enlisted advisor uh, to the director of the Center for the American Profession and Ethic, an organization that no longer exists. Uh, this organization merged with uh, the Center for the for Army Leadership last year around April of 2019 and was transferred from West Point to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where now it's called CAPEL, Center for Army Profession and Leadership. And that organization that now oversees all aspects of the development and integration of uh, the Army ethic, character development, and Army leadership across the institutional Army and the operational Army. So I think that's a, that's a good summary, uh, a little bit choppy at points because, you know, it, again, it's, it's hard to compress 30 years of experience and, and training education experience in, 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 in the short time, but I've done my best to just kind of give an accurate description of who I am and what, where, where, I have, where I have been and what I have done. Well, thank you for that, because uh, I'm going to take you back to 1997 in Hawaii. <laughs> That's when I met you. We were both yes. E6s, yes. except that you was an E6 at five years, and yes. I was an E6 at six years. <laughs> so you, you have, have me beat. Yeah, no, I remember. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned ethical behavior. And we'll be talking about, uh, you know, the examples and the folks that they gave you good example of what leaders are right you said do you gotta be you gotta know right you gotta learn you gotta you gotta be it you gotta and, and you also have to replicate it um and that's what we they they call us to do as leaders in the military but one thing that i remember specifically um was that not only at that time that we have met each other and spent some time together. Um, I realized at that point that, you know, at, at you make an E6 at five years, I said, the sky's the limit for this brother. And, and he should have go far, but I, I'm telling you, I didn't know it was going to be command sergeant major of the, of an ethics school, right? Leadership school, West Point, um, uh, you know, surely God took you way farther than what I saw. I just knew you was going some places because you were already uh, displaying uh, leadership attributes that even I at a same rank looked up to. And so even at that point, you was already setting the example for myself uh, to, to follow. And, and that's what true leaders do. Uh, when they're engaged and you talked about ethical performance and you hinted on the on the question that we're going to dive into right now because it truly is the the foundation of what we do um, ethical behavior and leadership is a must it, it has to be there or there's going to be not only the leader that gets hurt there's going to be people who get hurt uh, because of it right so uh, we'll, we'll digress a little to the uh, to the question, which was, uh, what does ethics mean to you? And then how did that guide your career? And you gave a little uh, backdrop to that, but how did that guide your career? Yes, well, ethics, um, you know, when you're a young soldier, you know, in the Army, you, you don't realize um, <clears throat> the role of ethics in the decisions and actions that you make, how, how critical that is. And the reason for that is because, you know, you're a follower. You know, we're talking about ethics, leadership, ethics and leadership. 
but when we talk about leadership and, and you know, they're, by the way, they're inextricably connected. Okay? You cannot separate ethics from leadership. You know, years ago, um, there, there was this, this idea that, for, in, for instance, in the army in particular, uh, that the chaplain was the uh, moral compass of the unit, right? Let's, let's take that, you know, with a grain of salt. The, the chaplain, because it's a religious leader trained in, 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 in theology and in ethics and morals and, and things of this nature, you know, was, you know, in, in a large part responsible for ethical conduct in the organization. And, you know, along with that, you know, he advised the commander on, on ethical matters and moral matters and, and religious matters. Um, and, and their impact on military operations. You know, that, that has, a, that has a, a, a realm of ramifications that sometimes you have to be very intentional about thinking, you know, what will happen in this situation? You know, what will be the ethical ramifications if we do course of action A or course, course of action B or course of action C? And what if we miss the target? or, you know, kill civilians. You know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stake in this, in this conversation. Um, but then, you know, in my last five years, as I engage in this process of working with uh, the training and doctrine command, uh, you know, in the army, in TRADOC, and, you know, and, and, and a command sergeant major by the name of David Devonport, who was a TRADOC command sergeant major at that time, uh, when, when I was at Fort Jackson and then later on at West Point, uh, he came up with an idea called the uh, Non-Commissioned Officer 2020 Strategy. And in that strategy, we started to restructure how do we want to see, what, what kind of NCO, Non-Commissioned Officer, mid-grade leader, junior leader, mid-grade leader, senior leader at the strategic level, we want to have in 2020. It took five years to build that plan. And one of the things that we wanted in one of the domains of transformation in the army was we want a leader of character. But to get a leader of character, you need to invest in the development of character. You know, ethics, you don't get to ethics just by osmosis. It just doesn't happen naturally. Before you get to having an ethical leader, you need to have a leader to understand his or her identity. Identity is fundamental because it, it goes back to the B. One of the attributes that we used to, you know, back in the days, we used to say the attributes of the NCO, non-commissioned officers, are be, know, and do. Now we have three new attributes that we build within the leaders, uh, uh, the, the leader requirements model, which, which are character, presence and intellect. We got to develop those because that's what we, we decide the leader of the future will require. And then we have the competencies, right? For that model, which are the leader leads, the leader develops and the leader achieves results. So within that framework of the NCO 2020 strategy, uh, there was a consensus that we want every leader Enrique to be ethical. It just can't be the chaplain, the one, the only one in the organization. It can't just be the release of first specialist. It cannot just be the commander or the commanders, because if you have an organization of, you know, a brigade combat team of, you know, between 3,000 and 5,000 people, you know, you, you're going to run out of options quickly. You need every leader to be ethical. That means from the, from the team leader, the E5, all the way the, you know, to, to the chain of command, the spectrum of the NCO support channel to the command center major of the organization. And that, that's what I think revolutionized, um, you know, the, 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 this transformation on how we're, we want leaders to be in the future. Those attributes, character is really foundational and fundamental to achieve or to produce an ethical leader that makes decisions and actions that are consistent with the army ethic, which in fact is just a, 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 uh, a collective group of moral principles that guides our decisions and actions uh, in war and in peace. 
Uh, but in, in my case, you know, I think to answer your question, um, you know, you know how how I you know how the ethics what ethics mean to me. I think what that means to me is that they provide they provide the path for for success because you know you you have no idea how many how many examples of unethical leaders and toxic leaders and and, and leaders that have tarnished their reputation because of uh, unethical behavior because illegal conduct or misconduct or because of immoral behavior. Uh, have ended up in the first page of the Army Times or the Navy Times or the Air Force Times or, you know, Stars and Stripes. And by the way, I use a lot of those unethical, you know, th those what we call ethical failures. I use those as part of my presentation as I was, I was, as I was giving Army profession seminars across the Army. Uh, why? Because that is exactly the problem that we're trying to rectify. We're trying to change the course on, on how leaders must behave in an organization, institution, you know, looking at the, at the strategic size of the army, 1.4 people, at an institution that serves the American people. And, and that's a great responsibility because we take an oath. You and I took an oath. Every officer in the United States Army takes an oath, an oath of enlistment or oath of, of commission. And in that oath, we bind ourselves to the constitution of our country. And that is a solemn, that is a solemn commitment. And people forget that. People forget that. So it's a responsibility of every leader to remember to remind their constituents, their subordinates, that hey, you know, look at your behavior, you know, and look at what you signed up for. You know, that the what you see in the mirror is not the same. Um, so it's important. That's what it means to me. It means that the ethical conduct and behavior and those values and those principles that, that we believe in, that we intrinsically accept and believe, uh, we apply them to, to our uh, ethical reasoning, to making decisions, to taking actions. And those at the end, you know, will produce the best results for the Army and for, for whatever service you're serving in. So ethics are... Uh, uh, tremendously important in the conduct of military operations, not only back in garrison, but also wherever you are, you're a representative of the American people. You represent the people of the United States. And that's something that I pounded so hard uh, throughout my last two and a half years in the army, because I think there's a sense of, of lost. Uh, we, we have lost that uh, in the current generation that is coming up. And we, we did a phenomenal job. We integrated that back on uh, our, our programs of instruction from, from basic combat training all the way to the United States Army Youth Academy and beyond, even at the Army War College. Um, so it's all, it's all back in the pipeline. It's just, you know, we, 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 we pray that and hope that the leaders of, of, of the Army today uh, use this information in a practical manner and, and remind their soldiers and their, their subordinates that this is, this is important business. This is crucial that we continue to explain why we need ethical uh, ethical soldiers, ethical leaders in the force. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you, you know very well that uh, the, this particular topic is one of the reasons why Triad was even, uh, you know, pushed out into the open and, and pushed off into the, the big C was because there were so many, and there is still so many uh, ethical missteps, if you will, uh, at the leadership level. And so part of Triad's mission is to, you know, kind of thwart that away through education and through mentoring and through uh, giving uh, briefs and, and all of that. Um, you mentioned, uh, I, I like the fact that you mentioned how the Army has structured that now in a big plan and have made it back into the, or put it back into the fiber uh, or the fabric of what yes. it is to become a leader. Um, uh, when we, in, in terms of civilian leadership, right? Because this is this is the world we live in now. Um, you know, there still is just as you know a sample of our nation's uh, so, you know citizenship, which is the military. It's just a sample. Uh, things happen there. Things happen out here. So how do you see uh, ethics being a part of leadership 
Um, and how can the civilian populace start thinking about, you know, hey, this is something that we need to uh, come on board. What, what should they be doing? How do you see that being part of leadership? Yeah, well, I, um, I recently um, picked up this book uh, by the name of uh, The Ethical Leader, you know, by Morgan Witzel. It, it is a great reminder. Um, and again, he's not telling us anything new that we didn't know because we, right. we did the research uh, through the United States Military Academy. We use, uh, you know, different uh, venue, academic venues to, to validate our work uh, as we develop the Army's framework for character development, also to develop the Army ethic, which is that, that body of collective principles, moral principles that guide the decisions and actions uh, of, of, of soldiers and leaders, you know, throughout the force. And again, when I talk about this, you know, the army is, you know, as of last year when I left it, was a 1.4 million uh, strong organization institution. Um, and that, and that is, that consists of, you know, uh, soldiers and civilians, uh, you know, across three components, active duty, national guard and reserve. It's a huge organization, it's a huge institution. So, you know, in order for you to make a dent in terms of, you know, the effectiveness, the efficacy and the effectiveness of, of the work that we did over the, you know, past probably nine, 10 years, uh, as we were trying to develop, you know, lift up this off the ground, um, you have to think, you know, it takes time to mature, but it also takes a deliberate effort on the part of our current leaders to enforce you know, what has been produced and, and, and remind leaders, subordinate leaders that, hey, we have this available, we have to use it. We have to uh, make it a part of our training, uh, training program for the units, um, you know, and, and the professional development aspect uh, of, of our military, uh, professional military education. That, that's a critical piece because every individual that is competing for a promotion, and that's everybody, uh, including our, our civilian workforce, um, is going to get this material. So it's really important that they, they highlight the importance of, you know, because, uh, you know, one of the things that really, that, that I want to say with this is that in, in a lot of cases, leaders, um, and not all leaders, and there are a lot of leaders that are very uh, intentional about what they do and what, what outcomes they want to uh, obtain during their command time or during their time in leadership. But you don't wanna be in a reactive situation. You wanna be in a proactive position because when you're in a reactive position, what's gonna happen is that the blast of the, of the ethical failure or, or, or whatever the case may be, is gonna be so hard that you know, you're gonna feel the consequences very quickly. I mean, let's look at Fort Hood, for instance. I mean, a commander, two-star general gets relieved because of all these murders that have been happening there. Nobody, nobody even talk about it. I mean, so the new commanding general comes on board and he stops training for a period of time to address critical issues on, on the installation. And you know what's the most important piece? To rebuild trust with soldiers, with families, with the community and back with the American people. Because that is a critical piece and component of, of leadership. Ethical leadership produces trust. Now, I don't know if you ever read the book, The Speed of Trust, but you know, it's one of my favorite books, Franklin Covey. You know, we did some work with them. They were trying to help us kind of adjust some of the you know, you know, kind of uh, frame our, our ethical and uh, character development frameworks, uh, you know, and they talk about the four course of cap uh, the four course of credibility. You know, they talk about intent, they talk about integrity, which is basically character, and they talk about capabilities, you know, which is, they talk about competence, which is capabilities and results. You know the two are connected. If you don't, if the, you don't have, if you don't get the bottom part right, the upper part, the results. You know, it's like you can't win at any at any cost. You you have to win in the right way. 
you have to produce the results in the right way because once things get out of hand and you know uh, people are not using ethical standards in the application of their expertise then you know you start losing um, you start losing trust internal trust and external trust and that that is a broad subject but you know that's how we break it down most importantly with American people um, so definitely ethics and leadership are you know intimately connected because we expect people expect the leaders to be ethical leaders to be to be the people that they can they can model after they can follow and if you're going to follow someone you want to follow someone that sets the right example for you you know in in, in this aspect of leadership i want to i want to uh, share the definition of leadership there are many definitions of leadership out there but i want to i like the army's definition of leadership and it says in uh, you know in the leadership uh, uh, doctrinal reference, uh, you know, 6-22, that leadership is the process of influencing people to accomplish the mission by providing purpose, direction, and motivation, and improving the organization. So a critical piece in this definition of leadership is influence. How do you want to influence people throughout your organization, throughout your section? throughout your division, throughout, you know, whatever is given to you, whatever the sphere of influence is given to you as a leader, how do you want to affect uh, change in those individuals? See, leadership is much more than uh, position, title, prestige, exposure. You know, those things come with leadership. Leadership is really about making a difference in people's personal lives and professional lives. Now I say this, and most people may, may disagree with me. Well, you know, we don't get involved with personal things in, in, in people's lives. Well, I can prove anybody because I had that experience. When soldiers started to tell me that their personal lives were personal to them, I said, well, I, I respect that. However, I wanna make sure that your personal life is in order, meaning your finances, meaning your marriage, your relationships, you know, all your personal affairs are in order. Why is that? Because I discover that when people start to hide stuff from you and those problems become a real problem, they bring them to work. They bring them to, to the organization and, and to the squad, to the platoon, to the company, to the battalion, brigade, whatever. And, and then you have a soldier, you have an individual that, that can only perform at 50% of what they're supposed to produce or perform because they have personal issues. And those personal issues are interfering with the mission. So how, how you're telling me that your personal life doesn't matter in your professional life? That is absolutely incorrect. It does matter what happens in your home because if you have a fight with your wife or you have an issue with your children, I guarantee you, you're bringing those issues to work. They're not just, you're just gonna park them outside your house or in the parking lot outside the, the unit. No, they're coming with you. And, you know, as we say, there are five, five components, um, you know, the, the, the five components to, to soldiers. Number one, you have emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual, and social. Those are the five domains of the human dimension as we see it in the army. And leaders have to deal with all those components at one point or another. So it's really important that we understand how connected leadership and ethics are in terms of, you know, the, the leader is, is setting up the example. You know, he, he, he not only following the legal aspect of the army ethic, which, you know, is regulations, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, you have laws, you have uh, oath of enlistment and all these things. Those are the legal side of the ethic. Now you have the other side of the ethic, which is the aspirational side of the ethic. You don't want to be operating all the time on the left side of the ethic, you know, under the rules, regulations, oath and in, in, in the constitution, you know, um, the policies and all these different things that, that guide the legal side of the ethic. You want people to be aspirational in nature. I don't want to live on the left side of the ethic because at any moment I can misstep 
one step to the left and I'm in trouble. So you want to avoid that. So what we promulgated was leaders have the responsibility to be ethical because they set the model, they set the example, they set the standards for their subordinates to aspire to wanna be much than just a legal, you know, one legal, one step of, of the legal uh, aspect of the ethics. So, you know, when we talk about the, the moral aspirational aspects of the ethic, we're talking about, um, you know, the creeds, we're talking about principles, beliefs, values, how those things shape, you know, more of an Aristotelian uh, virtue ethics. That's the model that we, we adopted for this. And they, they really shape, you know, uh, in, a, in a very nice way, how, how we turn out, you know, soldiers into leaders and how they, they see the value of acting ethically because they, 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 they have a value in them, within them, it's innate to them. They have those principles, you know, uh, you know, principle leadership, you know, that's, that's something that everybody wants. And then we have uh, those creeds that we have, you know, in, in, the, in the armed forces, in the Navy, Air Force, Army, uh, one line of, of the uh, NCO creed that I love because, you know, even though it's not legal, it's not binding in nature, but it really represents our identity as non-commissioned officers is, is one of the last lines of the first paragraph that says, um, I will not use my greater position to attain pleasure, profit, or personal safety. Now think about that. See, leadership is much more than title, position, prestige, exposure, all these different perks that come with leadership, you know, titles and whatnot. Leadership is about making a difference in people's lives. And if you're not, if you don't have people at the forefront of your leadership uh, philosophy, which we have to develop in the army, you know, you're going to make a bad leader. You're going to make the front lines sooner or later. I guarantee you it's going to happen because it's about servant leadership. It's about putting others before self. And that's called selfless service, one of the army values. I hope this, this explains a long explanation, but it's deep and very profound as we try to explain the connection between ethics and leadership. And, and what can leaders do to incorporate ethics into their day-to-day? -day? Well, you know, I was, uh, it was uh, 2006 or 2007, and I was, uh, for the second time, at U.S. Uh, Army Pacific on Fort Shafter. <clears throat> and uh, we had a new commanding general, a three-star general for U.S. Army Pacific by the name of Randy Mixon. And General Mixon... Uh, when he sent out his, uh, his uh, commanding general pet peeves and his, uh, his pet peeves and his, you know, his uh, commanding guidance and all these different things, <clears throat> the first line of his pet peeves was, hope is not a method. Now, let me tell you, that stuck with me for the rest of my military career. Why is that? Because when, when we talk about incorporating ethics, into your day-to-day, -day, into the day-to-day -day life cycle of an organization, a unit, a company, a business. The first thing you gotta think about is this. You must be intentional about it. You must be deliberate. It cannot be an afterthought. I think you and I discussed the fact that if you, if you intend your, your business to be successful and you want an ethical business, you know, meaning that you do the right thing for your customers, you know, you apply, you, 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 you develop and you uh, institute ethical principles and values that permeate throughout the whole business model. It has to be done early on as you develop your business model. Again, you cannot do this as your way advanced and, and, and ethical issues and ethical failures start to arise and pop up in your organization, different sections in your controlling office or marketing or, you know, uh, uh, you know, human resources, logistics, you know, there's so much, there's so much that goes on in a company. Uh, there's so many pieces to it that you need to be intentional about building this and knitting this within the fabric of the organization. I think that will, will save your day down the road when, when you face ethical challenges and your, your subordinates your workforce is exposed to ethical challenges and ethical dilemmas. 
They're going to come. It's not a matter of if, it's when they come. Are you ready or are they ready to face them and make the best possible decision uh, that will produce the best possible outcome that will preserve and protect the integrity of the brand and of the business? You know, uh, Morgan Witzel, you know, makes a, a beautiful statement here, and I'm going to quote it. He says, being ethical creates trust. Trust builds strong relationships. And out of relationships comes value. Internal and external relationships is really important. Why? Because, you know, the leader builds those internal relationships with, with his or her subordinates, with, you know, with those that are in, in ingrained in their organization. And externally, you know, that's what your external audience, you know, any misstep, any, any ethical violation, you know, things that get out of proportion, you know, we live in a, in a world of social media and almost, you know, uh, news travel at the speed of light. Uh, before you even know it, you know, you find yourself in any of these uh, newscasts, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can quote an example that personally affected me and it has nothing with military, but it has to do with, uh, you know, one of my banking institutions a couple of years ago when I uh, signed up for a mortgage loan. Um, you know, they missed that big time. They made public news. And, you know, in their rebuilding strategy, what really caught my eye was the fact that they said established in 1860, whatever, reestablished in 2016 or 15, whenever, I think it was 2016. You don't want to be there. You don't want to put your brand in that precarious situation where you have to rebrand yourself and explain why people need to trust you. Guess what? I don't trust them anymore. I don't care. Um, I don't want to do business with them anymore. I won't put a penny in that bank. But unfortunately, you know, I have to go to this mortgage loan for for as long as I, uh, I have this property, I'm trying to cancel this as soon as I can, but I don't want to do business with an institution that I cannot trust. And that is important. So trust is at the heart of all this that we're talking about. Ethical leaders produce trust. Trust produces value. And value intensifies and magnifies our brand, our services, our products in a way that people want to buy our products, our services. That's, that's the value added. And sometimes, uh, Enrique, unfortunately, ethics, you know, is one of those uh, intangible things that people don't want to talk about. They don't want to invest in the intangibles. Why? Because they don't see the value until something tragic happens and then their brand is tarnished and they suffer great loss. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, and leadership and ethics is a topic that can be talked, uh, and, and we have, we, we've talked for weeks teaching this, these things to leaders across uh, our nation's finest. And so, you know, uh, one podcast isn't enough, but, but, um, <laughs> but, but if, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, talk to you about uh, ethics or talk to you about uh, your leadership background, how, how would they do that? Well, um, you can write me at my uh, email, um, it's Bolanos, Boris1 at gmail.com. I'll spell that for you. B-O-L-A-N-O-S, B-O-R-I-S, one at gmail.com or at LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well, uh, Boris.Bolanos. Uh, you can find me there. And also, you know, through your, um, you know, through your uh, podcast, uh, they can write questions to you and then, you know, we can, we can discuss it. Uh, uh, at a later time. Well, thank you so much, uh, Boris, for being with us uh, today, uh, folks. Uh, leadership and ethics—it's not a—it's not a glamorous thing, but it could be a very detrimental thing if you don't treat it right. So, uh, you know, yeah, it, it may not be the thing you want to throw your money at, but it, you might want to reconsider that uh, because you'll be throwing a whole lot more money at the, uh, you know, at, at the trying to get everything right. Uh, and then the aftermath is always ugly. So uh, keep ethics at the forefront of your leadership. Keep ethics a part of your company, your organization. 
make sure you talk about it and make sure that you that it's plain. It's plain of, of your stance on it and how you feel about it among the people that uh, make your organization. Uh, so once again, Boris, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, for everybody out there, uh, we'll have his information part of the video. Uh, and as we like to say in closing out, success to you.